Catch a man a fish, and you can sell it to him. Teach a man to fish, and you ruin a wonderful business opportunity. Karl Marx, hey good people, welcome to Audiobooks 2.0. In this video, we share with you the biography of Karl Marx. Hope you enjoy watching this video. So, let's get started. David McClellan is professor of political theory at the University of Kent. His numerous books have been translated into many languages. His most recent publications are Simone Weil, Utopian Pessimist and Unto Caesar, The Political Relevance of Christianity and he is now working on a book which relates recent case law to political theory. Tree? Bought in Berlin, I feel myself suddenly invaded by doubt and ask myself if your heart is equal to your intelligence and spiritual qualities, if it is open to the tender feelings which here on earth are so great a source of consolation for a sensitive soul. I wonder whether the peculiar demon, to which your heart is manifestly a prey, is the spirit of God or that of Faust. I ask myself, and this is not the least of the doubts that assail my heart if you will ever know a simple happiness and family joys and render happy those who surround you. Childhood. It may seem paradoxical that Karl Marx, whom so many working-class movements of our time claim as their master and infallible guide to revolution, should have come from a comfortable middle-class home. Yet to a remarkable extent he does himself epitomize his own doctrine that men are conditioned by their socio-economic circumstances. The German city in which he grew up gave him a sense of long historical tradition and at the same time close contact with the grim realities of the underdevelopment then characteristic of Germany. Thoroughly Jewish in their origins, Protestant by necessity yet living in a Catholic region, his family could never regard their social integration as complete. The sense of alienation was heightened in Marx's personal case by his subsequent inability to obtain a teaching post in a university system that had no room for dissident intellectuals. Marx was born in Trier on May 5, 1818. A community of about 15,000 inhabitants, it was the oldest city in Germany and one of the loveliest dots situated as it was in the Mosul Valley, surrounded by vineyards and luxuriating in an almost Mediterranean vegetation. Under the name of Augusta Trevor Rum, the city had been considered the Rome of the North and served as the headquarters of the most powerful of the Roman armies. The Porta Nigra, in whose shadow, literally, Marx grew up, and the enormous 4th century basilica were enduring monuments of imperial glory. In the Middle Ages the city had been the seat of a prince-archbishop whose lands stretched as far as Metz, Toul and Verdun. It was said that it contained more churches than any other German city of comparable size. Marx did not only get his lifelong Rhineland accent from Trier, more importantly, his absorbing passion for history originated in the very environment of his adolescence. But it was not just the city of Roman times that influenced him. During the Napoleonic Wars, together with the rest of the Rhineland, it had been annexed by France and governed long enough in accordance with the principles of the French Revolution to be imbued by a taste for freedom of speech and constitutional liberty uncharacteristic of the rest of Germany. There was considerable discontent following incorporation of the Rhineland into Prussia in 1814. Trier had very little industry and its inhabitants were mainly officials, traders and artisans. Their activities were largely bound up with the vineyards whose prosperity, owing to customs unions and outside competition, was on the decline. The consequent unemployment and high prices caused increases in beggary, prostitution and emigration. More than a quarter of the city's population subsisted entirely on public charity. Thus it is not surprising that Trier was one of the first cities in Germany where French doctrines of utopian socialism appeared. The archbishop felt himself compelled to condemn from the pulpit the doctrines of Saint Simon, and the teachings of Fourier were actively propagated by Ludwig Gall, secretary to the city council, who constantly emphasized the growing disparity and hence opposition between the rich and the poor. Marx was all the more predisposed to take a critical look at society as he came from a milieu that was necessarily excluded from complete social participation. For it would be difficult to find anyone who had a more Jewish ancestry than Karl Marx. The name Marx is a shortened form of Mordecai, later changed to Marcus. His father, Heinrich Marx, was born in 1782, the third son of Meyer Hellebi Marx who had become rabbi of Trier on the death of his father-in-law and was followed in this office by his eldest son Samuel, Karl's uncle, who died in 1827. Meyer Hellebi Marx numbered many rabbis among his ancestors who came originally from Bohemia, and his wife, Cheich, had an even more illustrious ancestry. She was the daughter of Moses Luo, rabbi in Trier, whose father and grandfather were also rabbis in the same city. The father of Moses, Joshua Heschel Luo, had been chosen rabbi of Trier in 1723, corresponded with the leading Jewish personalities of his time and had been widely known as a fearless fighter in the cause of truth. 
It was said of him that no important decision was taken in the Jewish world without his having first been consulted. The father of Joshua Heschel, Aaron Lowe, was also rabbi in Trier and then moved to Westhofen in Alsace where he held the rabbinate for 20 years. Aaron Lowe's father, Moses Lowe, came from Lemberg, the German name for Lowe, in Poland, and numbered among his ancestors Mayor Katzen Alenbogen, head of the Talmudic High School in Padua during the 16th century, and Abraham Halevi Menz, rabbi in Padua, whose father had left Germany in the middle of the 15th century owing to persecutions there. In fact, almost all the rabbis of Trier from the 16th century onwards were ancestors of Marx, less is known of the ancestry of Karl's mother, Henrietta, but she seems to have been no less steeped in rabbinic tradition than her husband. She was Dutch, the daughter of Isaac Pressburg, rabbi of Nijmegen. According to Eleanor, Karl's daughter, in her grandmother's family the sons had for centuries been rabbis. In a letter to the Dutch socialist Pollock, Eleanor wrote, It is strange that my father's semi-Dutch parentage should be so little known. My grandmother's family name was Pressburg and she belonged by descent to an old Hungarian Jewish family. This family, driven by persecution to Holland, settled down in that country and became known, as I have said, by the name Pressburg, really the town from which they came. Marx's father was remarkably unaffected by this centuries-old tradition of strict Jewish orthodoxy. He had broken early with his family, from whom he claimed to have received nothing apart from, to be fair, the love of my mother, and often mentioned to his son the great difficulties he had gone through at the outset of his career. At the time of Marx's birth he was counselor at law to the High Court of Appeal in Trier, he also practiced in the Trier County Court, and was awarded the title of Justice Rat, very roughly the equivalent of a British QC. For many years he was president of the City Lawyers Association and occupied a respected position in civic society though he confined himself mostly to the company of his colleagues, although his beliefs seem to have been very little influenced by his Jewish upbringing, Heinrich Marx's conversion to Christianity was one made solely in order to be able to continue his profession. The Napoleonic laws had given Jews in the Rhineland a certain equality but had attempted to impose strict controls over their commercial practices. On the transference of the Rhineland to Prussia, Heinrich Marx addressed a memorandum to the new governor-general in which he respectfully requested that the laws applying exclusively to Jews be annulled. He spoke of his fellow believers and fully identified himself with the Jewish community. But the memorandum was without effect. The Jews got the worst of both worlds. In 1818 a decree was issued keeping the Napoleonic laws in force for an unlimited period, and two years earlier the Prussian. The government had decided that the Rhineland too should be subject to the laws that had been in force in Prussia since 1812. These laws, while granting Jews rights equal to those of Christians, nevertheless made their holding of positions in the service of the state dependent on a royal dispensation. The president of the provincial Supreme Court, von Seeth, inspected tour of the Rhineland in April 1816 and interviewed Heinrich Marx, who impressed him as someone of wide knowledge, very industrious, articulate and thoroughly honest. As a result he recommended that Heinrich Marx and two other Jewish officials be retained in their posts. But the Prussian Minister of Justice was against exceptions and Heinrich Marx was forced to change his religion to avoid becoming, as von Seeth put it, breadless. He chose to become a Protestant though there were only about 200 Protestants in Trier and was baptized sometime before August 1817. It was at this period that he changed his name to Heinrich having been known hitherto as Heschel. Marx's mother, who remains a shadowy figure, seems to have been more attached to Jewish beliefs than his father. When the children were baptized in 1824 the eldest son, Karl, being then of an age to start school her religion was entered as Jewish with the proviso that she consented to the baptism of her children but wished to defer her own baptism on account of her parents. Her father died in 1825 and she was baptized the same year. Her few surviving letters are written in an ungrammatical German without any punctuation. The fact that her letters even to her Dutch relations were in German suggests that she spoke Yiddish in her parents' home. Being very closely attached to her own family, she always felt something of a stranger in Trier. The few indications that survive portray her as a simple, uneducated, hard-working woman whose horizon was almost totally limited to her family and home, rather over-anxious and given to laments and humorless moralizing. It is therefore quite possible that Henrietta Marx kept alive in the household certain Jewish customs and attitudes. It is impossible to estimate with any precision the influence on Marx of this strong family tradition. The tradition of all the dead generations weighs like a mountain on the mind of the living, he wrote later. Jewishness, above all at that time, was not something that it was easy to slough off. 
Heine and Hess, both intimate friends of Marx, the one a convert to Protestantism for cultural reasons, the other an avowed atheist both, retained their Jewish self-awareness until the end of their lives. Kven Marx's youngest daughter, Eleanor, though only half-Jewish, proclaimed constantly and with a certain defiant pride at workers' meetings in the East End of London, 1 a.m. a Jewess. The position of Jews in the Rhineland, where they were often scapegoats for the farmers' increasing poverty, was calculated to increase their collective self-awareness. Although civil equality had been achieved under the Napoleonic laws, the inauguration of the Holy Alliance and its policy of the Christian state inevitably involved an anti-Semitism on the double count that the religious Jews professed an alien faith and many claimed to be a separate people. In much of the bitterest polemic which Marx engaged in with, for example, Rouge, Proudhon, Bakunin and Diring his Jewishness was dragged into the debate. Whether Marx himself possessed anti-Semitic tendencies is a matter of much controversy, certainly, a superficial reading of his pamphlet on the Jewish question would indicate as much, and his letters contain innumerable derogatory epithets concerning Jews, but this does not justify a charge of sustained anti-Semitism. Some students of Marx believe they have found the key to Marx's whole system of ideas in his rabbinic ancestry. But although some of his ideas and even lifestyle have echoes of the prophetic tradition, this tradition itself is more or less part of the Western intellectual heritage, and it would be too simplistic to reduce Marx's ideas to a secularized Judaism, typically. Jewish attitudes were certainly not in keeping with the general views of Marx's father. According to Eleanor, he was steeped in the free French ideas of the 18th century on politics, religion, life and art. He subscribed entirely to the views of the 18th century French rationalists, sharing their limitless faith in the power of reason to explain and improve the world. In this belief these French intellectuals tempered the dogmatic rationalism of the classical metaphysicians like Leibniz with the British empiricism of Locke and Hume. They believed that they were capable of showing that men were by nature good and all equally rational. The cause of human misery was simply ignorance, which resulted partly from unfortunate material circumstances and partly from a deliberate suppression or distortion of the truth by those in authority, whether civil or religious, in whose obvious interest it was to perpetuate the deceptions under which mankind labored. One of the chief means of destroying this state of affairs was education, another was change in material conditions. His surviving letters show that Heinrich Marx was indeed, in the words of his granddaughter Eleanor, a real Frenchman of the 18th century who knew his Voltaire and Rousseau by heart. His religion was a shallow and moralising deism. Edgar von Westphalen, Karl Marx's future brother-in-law, described Heinrich Marx as a Protestant a la Lessing. His outlook on life is well summed up in the advice he gave to Karl, a good support for morality is a simple faith in God. You know that I am the last person to be a fanatic. But sooner or later a man has a real need of this faith, and there are moments in life when even the man who denies God is compelled against his will to pray to the Almighty. Everyone should submit to what was the faith of Newton, Locke and Leibniz a Heinrich Marx was also closely connected with the Rhineland liberal movement. He was a member of a literary society, the Trier Casino Club, founded during the French occupation and so-called from its meeting place. The liberal movement gained force after the 1830 revolution in France, and the club held a dinner in 1834, when Karl was 16, in honor of the liberal deputies from Trier who sat in the Rhineland parliament. This dinner part of a campaign for more representative constitutions was the only one held in Prussia, though many such were held in non-Prussian areas of Germany. Although Heinrich Marx was extremely active as one of the five organizers of this political dinner, the toast he eventually proposed was characteristically moderate and deferential. The nearest he got to the demands of the liberals was effusively to thank Frederick William III, to whose magnanimity we owe the first institutions of popular representation. He ended, let us confidently envisage a happy future, for it rests in the hands of a benevolent father, an equitable king. His noble heart will always give a favorable reception to the justifiable and reasonable wishes of his people. Several revolutionary songs were then sung and a police report informed the government that Heinrich had joined in the singing. The dinner caused anger in government circles, and this anger was increased by a more radical demonstration two weeks later, on the anniversary of the founding of the Casino Club, when the Marseillaise was sung and the tricolor brandished. The Prussian government severely reprimanded the provincial governor and put the Casino Club under increased police surveillance. Heinrich Marx was present at this second demonstration, but this time refrained from joining in the singing, he was no Francophile and hated what he termed Napoleon's mad ideology. 
Although his liberal ideas were always tempered by a certain Prussian patriotism, Heinrich Marx possessed a sympathy for the rights of the oppressed that cannot have been without influence on his son, the Marx family had enough money to live comfortably. Heinrich's parents had been poor and, although his wife brought a fair dowry, he was a self-made man. The building in which Marx was born was a finely constructed three-story house with a galleried courtyard. However, Heinrich rented only two rooms on the ground floor and three on the first floor, in which he housed seven people as well as exercised his legal practice. Eighteen months after Karl's birth, the family bought and moved into another house in Trier, considerably smaller than the previous one, but comprising ten rooms and with a cottage in the grounds. The family had two maids and owned a vineyard near the city. Nevertheless, the low income tax paid by Heinrich Marx and some of his remarks and letters to his son, he urged Karl to send several of his letters together by parcel post as it was cheaper, suggests that there was not much money to spare. There were nine children in the Marx family of whom Karl was the third, but the eldest, Moritz David, died aged for the year after Karl's birth so that Karl occupied the position of elder son. He had an elder sister, Sophie, to whom he seems to have been particularly attached during his childhood, she later married a lawyer and lived in Maastricht in Holland. Marx's two younger brothers both died early from tuberculosis, as did two of his sisters. Of the two remaining sisters, Louise married a Dutchman, Judah, and emigrated with him to Cape Town, and Emily married an engineer and lived in Trier. Most of the little information about Marx's childhood comes from these sisters who told their niece, Eleanor, that as a child Marx was a terrible tyrant of his sisters, whom he would drive as his horses down the Marcusburg and Trier at full speed and worse, would insist on their eating the cakes he made with dirty dough and dirtier hands. But they stood the driving and ate the cakes without a murmur, for the sake of the stories Karl would tell them as a reward for their compliance. Up to the age of 12 Marx was probably educated at home. For the subsequent five years 1830-5, he attended the high school in Trier, which had formerly been a Jesuit school, and then bore the name Frederick William High School. Here he received a typically solid humanist education. The liberal spirit of the Enlightenment had been introduced into the school by the late prince-elector of Trier, Clement Wenceslas, who had adopted the principles of his famous predecessor Fabronius and tried to reconcile faith and reason from a Kantian standpoint. In order to combat the ignorance of the clergy he turned the school into a sort of minor seminary. It sank to a very low level under the French occupation but was reorganized after the annexation of the Rhineland and recruited several very gifted teachers. The chief influence in the school was its headmaster, Hugo Wittenbach, Karl's history teacher and a friend of the Marx family. He had made a favorable impression on Goethe as an adept of Kantian philosophy and took part in the founding of the Casino Club. After a big demonstration at Hambach in favor of freedom of the press in 1832, Wittenbach was put under police observation and the school was searched, copies of the Hambach speeches and anti-government satire were found in the possession of pupils. As a result of the casino affair of 1834, Karl Marx's fourth year at the school, the mathematics teacher was accused of materialism and atheism and the improved mankind in himself, but left it to him to seek the means by which he must attain this goal, left it to him to choose the position in society which is most appropriate and from which he can best elevate both himself and society. This choice offers a great advantage over other creatures but at the same time is an act which can destroy man's entire life, defeat all his plans, and make him unhappy. To every person there had been allotted his own purpose in life, a purpose indicated by the soft but true interior voice of the heart. It was easy to be deluded by ambition and a desire for glory, so close attention was necessary to see what one was really fitted for. Once all factors had been coolly considered, then the chosen career should be eagerly pursued. But we cannot always choose the career for which we believe we have a vocation. Our social relations have already begun to form, to some extent, before we are in a position to determine them. This sentence has been hailed as the first germ of Marx's later theory of historical materialism. However, the fact that human activity is continuously limited by the restructured environment is an idea at least as old as the Enlightenment and the Encyclopedists. It would indeed be surprising if even the germ of historical materialism had already been present in the mind of a 17-year-old schoolboy. It would be a mistake to think that, in his early writings, Marx was raising questions to which he would later produce answers, his later work, coming as it did after the tremendous impact on him of Hegel and the Hegelian school, contained quite different questions and, therefore, quite different answers. In any case, the subsequent passages of the essay, 
with their mention of physical or mental deficiencies, show that marks here merely means that when choosing a career one should consider one's circumstances, Marx then went on to recommend that a career be chosen that conferred on a man as much worth as possible by permitting him to attain a position that was based on ideas of whose truth we are completely convinced, which offers the largest field to work for mankind and approach the universal. Goal for which every position is only a means, perfection. This idea of perfectibility was what should above all govern the choice of a career, always bearing in mind that the vocations which do not take hold of life but deal, rather, with abstract truths are the most dangerous for the youth whose principles are not yet crystallized, whose conviction is not yet firm and unshakable, though at the same time they seem to be the most lofty ones when they have taken root deep in the breast and when we can sacrifice life and all striving for the ideas which Hold sway in them. Here, too, commentators have tried to discover an embryo of Marx's later idea of the unity of theory and practice. Once again, this is to read into Marx's essay much more than is there. All that Marx meant is that the sort of profession that deals with abstract ideas should be approached with special circumspection, for they can make happy him who is called to them, but they destroy him who takes them over hurriedly, without reflection, obeying the moment. The problem was above all a practical one and not at all posed in terms of theories. The essay ended with a purple passage revealing a pure, youthful idealism history calls those the greatest men who ennoble themselves by working for the universal. Experience praises as the most happy the one who made the most people happy. Religion itself teaches that the ideal for which we are all striving sacrificed itself for humanity and who would dare to gainsay such a statement, when we have chosen the vocation in which we can contribute most to humanity, burdens cannot bend us because they are only sacrifices for all. Then we experience no meager, limited, egotistic joy, but our happiness belongs to millions, our deeds live on quietly but eternally effective, and glowing tears of noble men will fall on our ashes. The essay was marked by Wittenbach, who qualified it as fairly good and praised Marx for being rich in ideas and well organized, though he rightly criticized Marx's exaggerated desire for rare and imaginative expressions. The enthusiasm for excessive imagery and the love of poetry that Marx was too. Display in his first years at the university were heightened by his friendship with Baron von Westphalen who was a third important influence on the young Marx in addition to his home and school. Ludwig von Westphalen was 12 years older than Heinrich Marx, being born in 1770 into a recently ennobled family. His father, Philip von Westphalen, an upright, straightforward, an extremely capable member of the rising German middle class, had been private secretary to the Duke of Brunswick during the Seven Years' War, had given essential help to his master in several military campaigns culminating in the Battle of Minden, and was consequently ennobled by George III of England. During the war he had married a Scottish noblewoman, Jeanie Wishart, who had come to Germany to visit her sister, whose husband, General Beckwith, commanded the English troops. Jeanie Wishart was descended from the Earls of Argyle and brought with her, among other things, the crested silver that Marx and Jenny later had so many occasions to pawn. The youngest of their sons, Ludwig von Westphalen, inherited the liberal and progressive views of his father. After the defeat of Prussia, he entered the civil service of the Napoleonic Kingdom of Westphalia and then became vice-prefect of the town of Salzwedel in North Saxony. His first wife, who had given him four children, having died, he married Caroline Hubel, the daughter of a horse trainer Ludwig and Caroline had three children, the eldest being Jenny, born in 1814 two years before they were to move to Trier where he was transferred, and slightly downgraded, as city councillor, he was not fully in agreement with the policies of the new Prussian government, and it was thought that his liberal views would be more at home in the ex-French Rhineland. The Westphalans moved into a fine house quite near to that of the Marxes, though they were by no means a rich family. As Heinrich Marx and Ludwig von Westphalen were both in the city's legal service and members of the small Protestant community, it was natural that they should become friends. Jenny became very intimate with Sophie Marx and the families were in constant contact. The Baron, now over 60, developed a particular affection for Karl. He was an extremely cultured man, spoke English as well as he spoke German, read Latin and Greek without difficulty and particularly liked romantic poetry. Eleanor Marx wrote that Baron von Westphalen filled Karl Marx with enthusiasm for the Romantic school and, whereas his father read Voltaire and Racine with him, the Baron read him Homer and Shakespeare who remained his favorite authors all his life. The Baron devoted much of his time to the young Marx, and the two went for intellectual walks through the wonderfully picturesque hills and woods of the neighborhood. As well as being a man of culture, the Baron was keen on progressive political ideas and interested Marx in the personality and work of the French utopian socialist Saint-Simon. Heinrich Marx approved of his son's attachment to the Baron and admonished him, 
you have good fortune such as is given to few young people of your age. On the first important stretch of life you have found a friend, and a very worthy one, older and more experienced than yourself. It will be the best test of your character, spirit and heart, indeed of your morality, if you can keep your friend and be worthy of him. Marx's gratitude for the Baron's friendship was such that in 1841 he dedicated his doctoral thesis to him in a most effusive manner. Forgive me, my dear fatherly friend, for prefacing an unimportant work with a name so beloved as yours, but I am too impatient to await another opportunity of giving you a small proof of my love. May all who have doubts of the power of the spirit have, like myself, the good fortune to admire an old man who has kept his youthful impulses and who, with wise enthusiasm for the truth, welcomes all progress. Far from retreating before the reactionary ghosts and the often dark sky of our time, you have always been able, inspired by a profound and burning idealism, to perceive, behind the veils that hide it, the shrine that burns at the heart of this world. You, my fatherly friend, have always been for me the living proof that idealism is no illusion, but the true reality. Student day s. In October 1835, at the early age of 17, Marx left home for the university. His whole family turned out at 4 o'clock in the morning to see him off on the steamer that took 16 hours to travel down the Mosul to Koblenz, where the following day he took a further steamer down the Rhine to Bonn. On the third day he registered himself as a student in the law faculty at the University of Bonn. The enthusiasm for romanticism that Baron von Westphalen had aroused in Marx thus supplanting to some extent the Enlightenment rationalism of home and school was increased by the year spent at Bonn. The city itself was scarcely larger than Trier. But the university with 700 students served as the intellectual center of the Rhineland, the dominant outlook there was thoroughly romantic and the most popular lectures, which Marx attended, were those given by the old A.A.W. Schlegel on philosophy and literature. In general, politics was little discussed, the university, like most in Germany, had experienced a wave of free speech and anti-government activity in the early 1830s, but this had been thoroughly suppressed. Marx began the year with great enthusiasm for his work, putting himself down for nine courses, which he subsequently reduced to six on his father's advice, three of which were on literary subjects. His first end-of-term report said that he followed all six courses with zeal and attention. The second term, however, following an illness from overwork at the beginning of 1836, he reduced the number of courses to four and gave much less time to formal studies. His father continually complained of his son's inability to keep his family informed of his activities. On his arrival in Bonn he left them three weeks without news and then produced only two short letters in three months. He was also spending much more money than his family could afford a lifelong characteristic. During the first semester, Marx shared a room with a highly respected philosophy student from Trier, who had entered the university a year earlier, became one of the 30 members of the Trier Tavern Club and was soon one of its five presidents. The activities of the club were largely confined to drinking and Marx entered so fully into the spirit that he found himself imprisoned by the university. For disturbing the peace of the night with drunken noise, though only for 24 hours, and the university prison was far from uncomfortable as the friends of the condemned man had the right to come and help him pass the time with beer and cards. During 1836 rivalry broke out in the university between the students from Trier and the young Prussian aristocrats in the Borussia Corps. Sometimes it degenerated into open fighting and in August 1836 Marx was wounded above the left eye in a duel. He was also denounced to the university authorities for having been in the possession of forbidden weapons in Cologne, but the investigation petered out. When not drinking and dueling, Marx spent most of his time writing poetry and joined a club of like-minded students. The club probably had political overtones. One of its members was Karl Gretin, one of the future founders of True Socialism. It was under police surveillance and had contacts with other university poetry clubs that were similarly suspect. In his rare letters home Marx was in the habit of enclosing specimens of his compositions which his father found quite incomprehensible. On being asked to bear the cost of their publication, he warned his son that, although I am very pleased with your poetical gifts and have great hopes of them, I would be very sorry to see you cut in public the figure of a minor poet. Well before the end of the academic year Heinrich Marx decided that one year at Bonn was quite enough and that his son should transfer to the University of Berlin. Before Marx set out for Berlin, however, another problem arose. Scarcely was the wild rampaging in Bonn finished, Heinrich Marx wrote to him during the summer vacation of 1836. Scarcely were your debts paid and they were really of the most varied nature when to our dismay the sorrows of love appeared. Jenny and Karl had been friends from earliest childhood. Jenny, with her dark auburn hair and green eyes, 
was widely noticed in Trier and had even been chosen as Queen of the Ball. The young Marx, who later described himself as a really furious Roland, was an insistent suitor, there had been an understanding between them before Marx left for Bonn and in the summer of 1836, this was turned into a formal engagement. By the standards of the time, the engagement was an extremely unusual one, Marx was only 18, Jenny was four years older, and there was also a certain difference in social status. At first only Marx's parents, and his sister Sophie who had acted as go-between for the lovers were let into the secret. Jenny's father gave his consent in March 1837. Marx's parents were not, initially at least, very keen on the match, and the pair had also to sustain years of unnecessary and exhausting conflicts with Jenny's family. Marx later denied vehemently his son-in-law's statement in a newspaper that the opposition from the Westphalans was based on anti-Semitism, and it is more likely that the conflicts arose from the generally reactionary attitudes of some members of that family. His taste for romanticism and poetry increased by his successful, if still semi-secret wooing, Marx left Trier in October 1836 for Berlin. The capital city was in almost total contrast to Bonn. Engels later graphically recalled the Berlin of the time with its scarcely formed bourgeoisie, its loudmouthed petty bourgeoisie, so unenterprising and fawning, its still completely unorganized workers, its masses of bureaucrats and hangerson of nobility and court, its whole character as mere residence backslash Berlin was, indeed, a very rudest city with no long-established aristocracy, no solid bourgeoisie, no nascent working class. With over 300,000 inhabitants it was nevertheless the largest German city after Vienna, and possessed a university three times the size of that in Bonn and totally different in atmosphere. Ten years earlier the student Farbach had written to his father, there is no question here of drinking, dueling and pleasant communal outings, in no other university can you find such a passion for work, such an interest for things that are not petty student intrigues, such an inclination for the sciences, such calm and such silence. Compared to this temple of work, the other universities appear like public houses we are exceptionally well informed about Marx's first year in Berlin, where he was to remain four and a half years, thanks to his one surviving letter to his father written, by candlelight, during the early hours of the morning, in November 1837. It is an extraordinarily intimate letter in which he retails at great length the spiritual itinerary of his last year. When I left you, he began, a new world had just begun to exist for me, the world of love that was at first drunk with its own desire and hopeless. Even the journey to Berlin which would otherwise have charmed me completely, exciting in me an admiration for nature and inflaming me with a zest for life, left me cold and, surprisingly, even depressed me, for the rocks that I saw were not rougher, not harsher than the emotions of my soul, the broad cities not more full of life than my blood, the tables of the inns not more overladen and their fare not more indigestible than the stocks of fantasies that I carried with me, nor, finally, was any. Work of art as beautiful as Jenny. A. As soon as he reached Berlin he reluctantly made a few necessary visits and then completely isolated himself in order to immerse himself in science and art. The writing of lyric poetry was his first concern, at least, as he himself put it, it was the pleasantest and readiest to hand. His poems written while he was in Bonn and those written during the autumn of 1836 in Berlin have not survived. The latter were written in three books entitled Book of Love, Part 1 and 2 and Book of Songs all Marx's present to Jenny von Westphalen on his arrival in Berlin. The text reads, I who tear I dot eve. Me inert torin evigilietten Jenny von Westphalen. Berlin, 1836, Amerni ties Lerbsts. Translation, To my dear, eternally loved Jenny von Westphalen. Berlin, 1836, at the end of the autumn. Three being dedicated to Jenny von Westphalen who, according to Sophie Marx, wept tears of delight and pain on receiving them. She kept them carefully all her life, though her daughter Laura related that my father treated those verses with scant respect. Each time that my parents spoke of them, they laughed outright at these youthful follies. According to the social democrat historian Maring, these poems, with one exception, were all love lyrics and romantic ballads. He had had the opportunity of reading them before the great majority were lost and judged them formless in every sense of the word. They were full of gnomes, sirens, songs to stars and bold knights, romantic in tone without the magic proper to romanticism. They were, said Marx, in accordance with my attitude and all my previous development, purely idealistic. My heaven and art became a beyond as distant as my love. Everything real began to dissolve and thus lose its finiteness. I attacked the present, 
Feeling was expressed without moderation or form, nothing was natural, everything built of moonshine. I believed in a complete opposition between what is and what ought to be and rhetorical reflections occupied the place of poetic thoughts, though there was perhaps also a certain warmth of emotion and desire for exuberance. These are the characteristics of all the poems of the first three volumes that Jenny received from me, most of the few surviving poems are those written during the first half of 1837, together with fragments of a dramatic fantasy and a comic novel. Marx tried to publish some of these poems and sent them to Adelbert von Chamisso, editor of the annual Deutscher Musenalmanic, but the issue had already gone to press. Although dedicated to his father, the poems were not much to his taste and Heinrich Marx even encouraged his son to attempt an ode which should glorify Prussia and afford an opportunity of praising the genius of the monarch. Patriotic, emotional, and composed in a Germanic manner. Marx's models, however, were Heine, Goethe, and Schiller, and his verses contained all the well-known themes of German Romanticism, with the exception of political reaction and nationalism. They were full of tragic love and talk of human destiny as the plaything of mysterious forces. There was the familiar subjectivism and extreme exaltation of the personality of the creative artist isolated from the rest of society, while seeking, at the same time, for a community of like-minded individuals. As a result of his love for Jenny, with disdain I will throw my gauntlet full in the face of the world and see the collapse of this pygmy giant whose fall will not stifle my ardor. Then I will wander godlike and victorious through the ruins of the world and, giving my words an active force, I will feel equal to the Creator. Other poems display a longing for something infinite and a love of death a la novelis, while still others consist entirely of a dream world of mystical imagination. To the aesthetic idealism of these poems was added a series of typically romantic ironical attacks on Philistines, people like doctors and mathematicians who followed utilitarian professions based on an ordered and rational approach to problems.to help him in his composition, Marx had copied out large extracts from Lessing's Laocoon, Soldier's Irwin, and Winkelmann's History of Art. Marx's habit of making excerpts from all the books he was reading, and sometimes adding comments of his own, stayed with him all his life and those notebooks that remain form a valuable guide to the development of his thought. He also wrote a few chapters of a comic novel, Scorpion and Felix, in the style of Stun and then gave that up to compose the first scene of Ulanum, a contemporary comic thriller whose hero was a feeble copy of the aging Faust. Ulanum, too, never got beyond an immensely long first act which contained frenzied reflections on love, in all its forms, death, destruction and eternity. Finally there was an interesting series of epigrams on Hegel, whom Marx accused of being arrogant and obscure. In the first epigram, he says, because my meditations have discovered the highest of things and also the depths, I am as crude as a god and cloak myself in darkness as he does, in my long researches and journeys on the wavy sea of thought, I found the word and remain firmly attached to my find the second epigram had the same theme, opening, I teach words that are mixed up in a devilish and chaotic mess. The most interesting was the last epigram Kant and Fichte like to whirl into heaven and search there for a distant land, while my only aim is to understand completely what I found in the street. The point of this epigram is totally misunderstood if it is taken to be Marx himself speaking. As in the former epigrams, it is Hegel who is speaking, criticized by Marx, the subjective romantic, for being too attached to day-to-day -day reality. The whole tenor of Marx's poems makes this an obvious criticism of Hegel, and it was a common one among Romantic writers. I in general Marx's first contact with Berlin University brought about a great change in the views he had expressed in his school-leaving essay. No longer was he inspired by the thought of the service of humanity and concerned to fit himself into a place where he might best be able to sacrifice himself for this noble ideal. His poems of 1837, on the contrary, reveal a cult of the isolated genius and an introverted concern for the development of his own personality apart from the rest of humanity. Marx's pension for romantic poetry was undoubtedly increased by the strain of his relationship with Jenny and the uncertainty of his future. While their engagement was still a secret from her parents, she refused to correspond with her fiancé at all. I have gained the complete confidence of your Jenny, Heinrich Marx wrote to his son, but the good, kind girl is continually tormenting herself, she is afraid of hurting you, of making you overstrain yourself, etc., etc. She is oppressed by the fact that her parents know nothing or, as I think, don't want to know anything. She cannot understand how she, who considers herself to be such a rational being, could let herself get so carried away. He advised his son to enclose a letter for Jenny full of tender, devoted sentiment. 
but taking a clear view of your relationship and definitely not a letter distorted by the fantasies of a poet, eventually it was decided that March should send a letter to the Baron declaring his intention and should give his own family a week's notice of its arrival so that his father could do his best to secure a favorable reception. Jenny herself, even when the engagement was accepted by her father, continued to be extremely apprehensive, being already past the age when most girls of her class were married. She has the idea, Heinrich Marx reported, that it is unnecessary to write to you. But what does that matter? You can be as certain as I am, and you know that I am hard to convince, that even a prince would not be able to steal her affections from you. She is attached to you body and soul. Jenny herself explained her state of mind that I am not in a condition to return your youthful romantic love, I knew from the very beginning and felt deeply even before it was explained to me so coldly, cleverly, and rationally. Oh, Carl, my distress lies precisely in the fact that your beautiful, touching passionate love, your indescribably beautiful descriptions of it, the enrapturing images conjured up by your imagination, that would fill any other girl with ineffable delight, only serve to make me anxious and often uncertain. If I gave myself over to this bliss, then my fate would be all the more frightful if your fiery love were to die, and you were to become cold and unwilling. You see, Carl, that is why I am not so completely grateful, so thoroughly enchanted by your love as I ought to be, that is why I am often mindful of external things, of life and reality, instead of holding fast, as you would like, to the world of love, losing myself in it and finding there a higher dearer spiritual unity with you enabling I any to forget all other things. Occasionally even Heinrich Marx began to regret that he had sanctioned the engagement and was full of sound advice that his son was obviously not in a position to follow your exalted and exaggerated love cannot bring back peace to the person to whom you have entirely given yourself and you run the contrary risk of entirely destroying her. Exemplary conduct, a manly and firm desire rapidly to raise yourself in the world without thereby alienating people's goodwill and favor, this is the only way of creating a satisfactory state of affairs and of both reassuring Jenny and raising her in her own eyes and those of the world. She is making an inestimable sacrifice for you and gives evidence of a self-denial such as only cold reason can fully appreciate. You must give her the certainty that in spite of your youth you are a man who merits the respect of the world and can earn it under the impact of his father's advice and the general atmosphere of the university, Marx's romantic period did not survive long. Poetry, even during his first year at Berlin, was not his only concern. He also read widely in jurisprudence and felt compelled to struggle with philosophy. In the Berlin Law faculty, the progressive Hegelian standpoint was represented by Eduard Gans, whose lectures Marx attended during the first term. Gans was a baptized Jew, a liberal Hegelian who in his brilliant lectures elaborated on the Hegelian idea of a rational development in history by emphasizing particularly its libertarian aspects and the importance of social questions.